Good morning, everyone. Kevin here from Skywatcher, and welcome to another episode of the What's Up webcast. We do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. We cover everything from what's up in the nighttime sky to equipment to helpful tips and tricks on imaging and observing. And of course, at the end of the month, we have a special guest on to talk about their specialty in the field of astronomy. And it is the end of June, which means it's the end of the month, which therefore means it's special guest day. Um, but before we get started, today is Friday, June 30th. Um, that's when this episode aired. Um, as with all of our past episodes, uh, these are recorded as well. So if you ever want to go back and learn something from a previous episode, all of them are there and available for you to return to. Um, if you want to support the What's Up webcast, please go over to uh, Threadless or skywatcher.threadless.com. You can buy cool swag and different material um, to support the channel, or you can also leave a like and subscribe to the channel. It lets us know we're doing a good job um, and that you want to see more of the content here. So we really appreciate that. Um, so today we have a, a very good friend of ours on. We work with him a lot. Um, his name is Simon Tang. Um, and he is a world-class solar imager. Um, and I'm just gonna go ahead right now and bring him on. And we're gonna actually be doing some live solar imaging today. Um, so I'm just gonna transition to that. Um, it's gonna be a pretty casual conversation today, but if you've got questions, please throw them into the chat and we'll bounce them around. Um, but anyway, hey Simon, how's it going? Good morning and good evening and good afternoon and <laughs> good night to everybody else all over around the world. Um, so, you are joining us from Southern California, just so people know where you're located um, and where the telescope is located too. But we are actually doing some live solar imaging right now with your rig or one of your rigs. That is indeed right. So um, just so everybody understands this, like, like Kevin just said, this is going to be a very, very casual thing. It's almost like a hangout for lack of a better description. Uh, but I will be going through the process and what I do to set up and all that kind of stuff. So, again, if you have questions, feel free to throw them at me. We will be doing um, some uh, image processing as well. Yes, uh, we're going to be running through uh, some of that. Uh, let's, st I guess let's start. Um, sorry, there's some stuff popping up on the back side. Um, just so people are aware... Um, there's a lot of different uh, solar equipment on the market. You have Lunt, you have Coronado, you have Daystar, you have Solar Spectrum. Um, you have a variety of them. And um, Simon, I didn't know if you could kind of run down kind of what your current rig is composed of so people have a better idea of what we're working with. Sure, of course. So in my particular case, um, I do have different scopes that I use for different purposes. Uh, and I'll go into that a little bit more in detail. But right now, what you guys are looking at, if you can see on the webcam, hopefully somewhere, uh, it's the Evo Star 150, which is probably the largest uh, doublet refractor that you guys make, I believe, right? Yeah, we don't make a. We've talked about it, but yeah. any if anybody has actually seen an Evo Star 150, they're not incredibly heavy telescopes, but they are rather large. Well, that's the great thing about these things, actually, is just because it's so. Uh, lightweight and portable and again remember you don't need a triplet when doing something like this because we're shooting uh, shooting in narrow band so a doublet is more than sufficient you don't have to have an apochromatic you can also get away with an acromat which is you know you can get them the scopes really cheap but in this particular case uh, I have the Evo Star and on the back of it is the Daystar Gemini specifically and the reason why I like using the Daystar Gemini is I have the ability to switch from chromosphere mode and prominence mode, depending on what it is that I'm doing. Yeah, because the Daystar Gemini, if you're not familiar with the Daystar uh, quarks, the quarks are basically a smaller version of the quantums that Daystar makes, which is their professional level filters, which are very large diameter etalons. Um, and if you're not familiar with what an etalon is, an etalon is an interference filter that is used to observe on the sun, um, as well as lasers and all kinds of other things like that. But for astronomy, we tend to use them in narrow band solar, um, particularly in the hydrogen alpha wavelength, which is what Simon is using right now. Um, and there are different types of etalons. There are air-spaced etalons, which is what Lunt and Coronado do. 
and solar scope and then there are solid etalons which is basically what um, daystar and solar spectrum are using um, but simon has the gemini and the gemini has two different etalons inside of it that can be switched um, one has a narrower band pass so you get more detail which is what we're seeing right now and pretty phenomenal detail um and then you have a broader one for like prominences and stuff right so um hopefully everyone's seeing this right now um there are questions coming in already so i'm going to quickly answer them and say you will see how to do the focusing and all that stuff in just one moment so let me just give you guys a quick run around the sun and i'm going to talk about some of the issues that you may notice upon and how to solve some of these problems so let's get this started so obviously we're looking at uh one of the sunspots right now and if i pan the telescope around we can start seeing all the different features there's quite a few going on today uh there's a particularly nice one which is actually right here so let's just see if we can reveal it there's a nice prominence which is also a um, filament at the uh, same time so people like to call it a filler prom Brian at Lunt calls it bacon. Because it looks like bacon, like when it crisps and kind of angles oh, I see. and turns. That's Brian's term for it. Oh, I haven't heard that one before. Yeah, he calls it bacon. This... But philoprom is what people probably notice it more as. <laughs> so here's a little fun one right here. This wasn't here earlier on. We've got spicules forming um, in a specific way. You'll see this one here. It'll get longer and then it'll just go back in again. So that's a nice little feature to be watching out for. Let's see if we can see anything else. There's a couple of small proms here. I don't know if there's a crown visible today. Uh, what, a, what a crown basically is, if you have filaments that run across, they will kind of like make this circular uh, dome shape on the pole of the sun. There was and... a really good one like two weeks ago. It was oh, like, there was? like oh, I must have missed that. all the way around. And I wish I had a camera to catch it because it looked awesome. Then we've got uh, more spicules and then a couple of other problems that are here. This one actually was, you can actually kind of just see the aftermath of it. This was actually from a CME, a very, very small CME that happened uh, earlier this morning. All right, so that gives you a quick run round of the sun or the quick tour. So let's um, identify the first thing here. A lot of people, when they shoot, uh with any type of edlon will notice that it's it could be uneven and what i mean by the unevenness is this you guys can probably notice there's a bright patch here and a darker patch here and so forth and so on oh don't know why that's coming up but just ignore it uh so yeah you can see that there's a brighter patch and a darker patch now that's basically the unevenness of any particular edlon and all edlons have this in some varying degree because when they polish these down um, even though they're machine polished and they're tested for a level of accuracy s small minute variances still changes how uh, even an edlon can look so the way we get around this is by shooting flats now i personally use um, some type of diffusion placed in front of the scope <clears throat> excuse me uh, so you can buy these things um, or you can make your own in some particular cases. The one I get specifically is from Daystar. It's called a flat cap or I call it the tambourine. So if you ever call them up and say, I would like a tambourine, they'll know what you're talking about, <laughs> I hope. So let's just pretend we have one um, and I can put it on the front. That will be one method of doing flats. Now, for those of you who don't want to spend that money or just want to get a quick, dirty result, the fastest way is to actually um, defocus the telescope. Now, it's probably the best and easiest method out there, but it's not necessarily the best in terms of accuracy. But for the sake of this, we're just going to show this to you. Now, I do want you to pay attention very closely to this little tiny spot here. Hopefully you can see where my mouse icon is. And it's right there. Uh, this is a piece of dirt that's actually on my camera that I purposely have not removed. Uh, and it's kind of out of the way, so I don't really care about it. It's not going to affect my image, but I do want you to pay close attention to it. So you can see it if I just move it in a location. There you go. You can actually see it better. Now, the aim of the game here is to find an area of the sun that does not have any features like this sunspot. And you'll see why in just a moment. 
So what I'm going to do is just hunt around and go, okay, this area here potentially is going to be good. I right about here is good. So I'm going to defocus the telescope, but I'm going to go inwards specifically. And as you can see, everything goes out of focus. And this shows all the things that are up with your system. So we've got Dust Bunny here, here. We've got a couple of fake ones here. We've got some nasty blobs all over the place. And this is just dirt and dust collected on your lens. Uh, a bit of vignetting in this corner. And as you can see, you can see how uneven this particular quark is going to be, or the Gemini is going to be, in my case. So what I'm going to do... Oh, go ahead. Uh, for the record, though, um, so people know, because it's quite common, especially in tech support, um, if your lens is dirty or your mirror, whatever it is, the spots on there are not going to show up in your image like Simon's got here. If you are seeing dust motes or any kind of weird things going on, it means it's near the focus point. So for solar, it's either on the Barlow lens, it's on the filter itself, it's on a diagonal if there's one in use, um, or it's on the camera itself. So a lot of people call up saying, oh, I'm seeing weird things in my images and I, how do I clean my lens? The lens isn't the problem. It's somewhere near the focus point. So for this matter, all these are on the camera itself, and that's where the flat will take care of it. Right. Uh, but I just, just so you guys can see, just as a quick demonstration, as I actually go back into focus, other than the uh, unevenness, you can see most of that stuff has disappeared with the exception of that great big blob there. Again, I've left that there on purpose so I can show you guys the demonstration of how this works. So now, going back... I'm sorry, Simon. I know someone asked this a little bit earlier, um, how you focus. So you're using a motor focuser, I think, particularly the oh, Optech. yeah. That's right. Uh, I, f I should have mentioned that. Yes, this is a motorized focuser uh, in this particular case, because otherwise it'd look really silly of me having to get up and run backwards and forwards to try and focus it. And quite honestly, most people don't like sitting outside and frying in the sun. It's a little so, toasty. Yeah. But it, that I mean, any robotic motorized focuser will make your life a lot easier when when just doing stuff like this so yeah, and if you're using ours or skywatcher stuff um zwo eaf is very popular um mm -hmm. i know some people are using pegasus focusers um i really like the optech focusers if you're using our larger refractors like the esprits or the evo star 150 dx has the esprit style focuser um their motor focusers are really nice because you can actually disengage the motor without removing it, which is not possible on pretty much any other motor available. So that's what Simon and I use is the SWX 30 is the model for Optech and it works great at night and obviously for solar. I mean, I should also mention um, the big difference between getting a good focuser and having a, a stock focuser in certain ways. If you do buy something like an inexpensive scope and it does come with uh, whatever the default focuser is, you know, consider this into your budget. Your scope is only as good as the focuser can perform. One of the biggest problems with doing stuff with um, something like the Daystar Quark and Gemini is there is a lot of weight hanging off of the back and you need to know that your focuser is nice and straight. Otherwise, you may get a slight tilt occurring. Um, again, I can't really demonstrate that right now because I'm not outside. I do wiggle the stuff around and you'll see what happens. So if you experience that, it's, it's what we call flexure. You do have to solve that in some shape or form. Especially anyway, on these going... longer systems. So take... oh, okay, God. back yeah, I mean, to I mean, if you Yeah, I was going to say, if you look at my system, it is, you know, um, I wish I could point it out somehow, but the, the somewhere on the camera on the stream, you should be able to see the scope has a bunch of extension tubes and it just yeah, gets longer and longer. Yeah, it's up here on the right, if anybody, right above Simon, um, his little floating head right here in front of all the camera controls. That oh, up, camera. Up there. There yeah, you go. There that's it is. the telescope <laughs> and the stuff hanging off the back. So anyway, we're back to taking flats, but that's how he's moving the focuser in and out from inside. Right. So the software that I'm using specifically is SharpCap, and SharpCap has a really cool feature where you can actually apply uh, flats or flat calibrations while actually using the system. So if you're not familiar with SharpCap, I strongly recommend you get yourself familiar with it and just go through some of the online tutorials. There's, there's tons, literally loads out on YouTube. 
So let's just get started. So I'm going to go to capture and I'm going to capture the flap. And what the aim of the game here is to do is you need to actually turn off your gain or set it to as low as possible. And you'll notice that the histogram has this really interesting spike. So if you see this and it's got two points to it, that tells you how uneven everything actually is. So what I need to do right now is get the exposure so it hits roughly 50%. So you kind of want to average it and you want to go for the back one if you've got two peaks or multiple peaks it's always the one in the back you want to aim for get that roughly 50 percent it kind of looks like batman doesn't it that's quite funny mm -hmm. I'm batman. so let's just do uh, a stretch real quick so you can actually see it and you'll notice that the exposure time is set to something and then whatever the gain is make sure it's set to zero do not mess with your offset if you already have a, an offset set make sure it's you don't mess with it because it will change where this curve goes Okay, and uh, I'll go into the offset if you do want to understand that a little better uh, later on. It's not important. So the amount of um, frames to average is also quite critical. If you have an inherently noisy sensor, you need to up this number to a reasonable amount. Now, since this is a, a modern camera that I'm using, it's a Player One uh, Apollo Max, I can actually get away with way less. In fact, I could drop it down to 50 if I wanted to, and that's what we're going to do. Now, there is also a bunch of options here. Um, this is basically back level offset corrections. Now, remember what I said about the offset. Once you have this set, do not change it ever. Otherwise, your bias frames that we're going to create will no, no longer work. And what we're interested in in the bias frames is to remove any hot or dead pixels in this case. So once I've set my histogram, I'm just going to hit start, let it do its thing. And it takes um, it sometimes takes a few seconds. Uh, depending on how many frames you've got and your exposure rate. In some cases, you may have to expose for like even two seconds in extreme cases. So when I'm using my flat cap, my exposure times can be as high as two seconds, uh, but I can actually lower the amount of frames to average because I know I'm going to get a good clean image. All right, so now that that's done, we actually have a flat field. And to prove that, there it is. So anybody going to notice the first problem right there? So what you're seeing here uh, is interference pattern, and that actually comes from when you use any type of telecentric system. Now, luckily for me, I already know what happens. Um, this actually won't be visible in the final result, believe it or not, but it will show up and exacerbate itself because we're doing a very harsh stretch on the actual histogram. So now here comes the magical part. Everybody asks, how do I focus? Now there's a reason why I wanna do an auto stretch off of this particular curve and you'll see why in just a moment when i zoom back out or sorry when i focus back out you'll notice the image start to build up and when it comes close to focus you'll see that the contrast will be the dead giveaway of when you're actually in focus okay and i'm going to show you this with and without um doing this curve thing this this adjustment and you'll actually see or you'll be able to tell uh, when it actually comes to focus. So around about here is where the harsh lines look its sharpest. If I stretch that, you'll see that we're nice and sharp. Hmm. That's pretty neat. So this is, this is what we call uh, edge contrast detection. Uh, it's actually a very well-known technique used by your DSLR or your mirrorless camera. So I'm gonna show you the same thing again uh, done here. So we're gonna purposely defocus. Let's just go nuts. So we end up with a, uh, a big spike. I'm going to do that. As I go out, the idea here is to get the contrast as high as possible. So you can see how easy it actually is. Now, most people are probably struggling because they're doing it like this. Okay, so if I try to focus using this particular method, it's gonna be very, very difficult. I mean, obviously we're doing steps or this whole thing could be repeated. So you, you're looking at it and you're just absolutely struggling to try and see, is this in focus? Or maybe I should just uh, get in closer and you're forever uh, clicking around on something like this. The, the real trick actually is increase the contrast. Thank you. 
Sorry, I just had a delivery. I, what did I say to you, Kevin, earlier? You were going to get your yes, delivery during the webcam. Show up right in the stream. <laughs> um, and then you can actually get it to this high contrast, and we can actually check focus. So I'm going to go out of focus. You can see how it's blurring. With this high uh, contrast, we can dial it right in. And you're just trying to get that central peak um, on the line, those uh, dashed no, lines. I'm, what I'm doing is visually looking at this. And okay. Seeing so you're using when... a monochrome image to get as much detail as sharp as possible. Exactly. So then, when I actually set the histogram correctly, it's a perfectly sharp image for all intent and purposes. Yeah. So you're so getting that's... rid of a lot of the the noise if you will to you're just getting it from black to white that's all you're worried about and getting it as sharp as possible in black and white exactly so that is basically how i do my flats if i'm in a hurry like if i'm out in the field and i don't have time this is the quick and easy method of doing it i like i said i prefer to use something that has a diffusion on the front because it gives a better result uh and then of course uh th that's actually my method of focusing and it's pretty quick and intuitive. Just basically get out there, practice it. You could do it by hand. You can do it with a, an electronic focuser of some description. The principle is exactly the same. There is another method known as phase detection, but that one's a little trickier to understand and it's very, very hard to see. And it does require doing something that is counterintuitive. Now, I'm just going to mention to you guys real quick, um, this is why I'm able to get really good results. Right now, we have what we refer to as 5-5 five, five seeing. Um, what I mean by that is, have you noticed that almost nothing is moving? Even the the focusing or the, uh, the softness doesn't change. And when you see something like this, that's when you get 5-5 five, five seeing. And I will show you the difference of what's going on in just a moment, because I've got some bad seeing images as well. All right, so let me get back on to the point at hand. Just going to set the exposure um, level correctly. All right. So going back to the flats, I'm going to show you what the difference is again. I'm going to turn the flat off. You can see where the unevenness is. And this is actually the most common complaint that I used to hear about people and their quarks slash their um, Geminis or even a quantum to a certain extent is the unevenness of this. By simply doing a flat, it will actually make all the difference. Yeah, it's nuts. So there's no hole as people call it or a dark patch or a lighter patch or any of that kind of stuff. And it makes it give you the impression that the whole thing looks even. Uh, and that's actually what the secret for my stuff is, at least, flats. And I can't keep stressing how important those things are. Uh, there's a real quick question about your setup. Um, any chance you can address the back focus or optical path? I've heard the integrated Barlow on a cork cancels the added back focus. Um, yes and no. If anything, what happens here is, is it actually will end up pushing it back more than anything else. So by default, most people who are using a quark of any description, they'll struggle to come to focus without a diagonal. And it's because you need the extension tubes. Now, when you most people say when they uh, reference back focus, there isn't actually any back focus to think about per se. It's actually just focus travel. Back focus would indicate that you have some kind of field flattener involved in the chain. Well, the problem here is, is I don't have a field flattener attached to this particular scope. So the back focus is actually not relevant. It's actually out travel that is the real problem let me go grab my day star and simon can keep talking about this but i've got my i should have just had it here but yeah that would have made sense all right while kevin's um scuffling and shuffling around looking for that um i will like i said i will show you the difference between good seeing and bad seeing um where is that sunspot okay going back to this i'm just going to quickly run through exposure uh real fast so a lot of people ask me, what should my ideal setting be for exposure? Uh, the easy answer to this is pay attention to your histogram because that is going to tell you the story of what Gosh. you need to get to. Now, ideally, let me get the bigger version to show up. 
Instagram. Ideally, you don't really want to go past the 70% mark on your end here. And the reason for that is if any bright things occur, and in this particular case a flare, this part of the histogram will have a high chance of being pushed off into 100%, which means that we're now overexposed. So you kind of want the edge of this to be close to 70%, and you can do that by either changing the gain or the exposure. Now, I prefer to only play around with the exposure in order to change that value and set the gain to be whatever uh, I want it to be. Now, obviously, the lower the gain, the less noise you have, but you have to have some. So you have to check with your camera to see where you get the most amount of dynamic range. So let's just assume that you guys all have the same camera and it's a ZWL. We'll just assume that you're going to set it to 139 in your particular case. That's what we call unity gain specifically. So now, like I said, I kind of want to get this part here to just touch the 70% by just changing the exposure. Okay. And that actually tells me, or that is going to give you the best exposure. Now, the fun part here is, let's get to a limb real quick. Uh, let's do the filler problem while we're at it. Uh, the question, so you're doing live flat with sharp cap. Yes. Yes, live flats with sharp cap. Now, another thing that people make is a common mistake is, is I want to see this problem, okay? And what they tend to do is they crank up the exposure I've in that. order to make the problem uh, show up. But if you notice, the histogram is just flying off the scale. The reality is this. You don't actually need to do that. The data is actually already there. Let me just set my gain back to uh, where it likes to be for this particular camera. Okay, so believe it or not, this histogram here, this peak right here, is actually the limb. And in order to see it, if I just move this, the curve, you'll see it's the same effect as me upping this. But there is a big difference that's going to occur here. Pay attention to my frames per second. I have 110 frames or 100 and however many frames per second here. As I increase this number, my frame rate drops down. And it's not because it's it can't handle it. It's actually because there are only so many milliseconds in a second. You cannot go beyond that. So you're limited by that time frame. So in order to get uh, a good exposure level, you can, you're can you just adjusting the histogram. And again, when I do the processing, you'll understand why this is so important. So don't be tempted to mess with the gain in order to get a prominence to show up. It is actually done in processing with the histogram, but you can see this live. Now, another cool feature about sharp cap, which is why I prefer to use it here, is if you're struggling to see anything and you're actually outside with your laptop uh, or your screen, I strongly recommend that you do an invert instead. It's way easier to see stuff. Uh, and, you know, it almost looks like a final image, for lack of a better description. Uh, a lot of you who probably pay attention and see some of my work will notice that it it's what I what you see on my feed is almost exactly what you would see here, as you can tell. All right, so do we have any other questions before we move on? Um, what apertures would you recommend for solar imaging to use under most conditions? Oh, um, so me and Kevin were actually uh, discussing this earlier on today before we actually went live because um, <laughs> aperture is always king, as they say, in, in solar. So again, with the scopes that I own, they're all big apertures. I have a 204, which is an 8-inch, and I have the uh, 150, which is essentially a 6-inch. And I do have an Esprit 100 as well that I occasionally use for solar. So we're going down scale. But for most people, depending on your seeing conditions... The average size that you should uh, aim for is anything from 100 millimeters going downwards. If your seeing supports it, then start thinking about doing a 120. Uh, if you've got really good seeings, like obviously, as you can see, my seeing can support this level. Anything bigger than 150 is fantastic. But on average, if you're new to this, go for small aperture. Uh, personally, if you do a lot of visual uh, anything from the 40 millimeter to the 60 millimeter range is absolutely perfect for that uh, series. And if you're doing full disc, a uh, 60 to an 80 millimeter with, like, say, a 174 or the 432 chip uh, from Sony, those would be great for doing full disc solar imaging. 
blocking filter also determines the size, but we'll go into that another time. Um, and then are you using an ERF on your 150? So the short answer is, is you should always use an ERF. Uh, if you're wondering what ERF stands for, it just simply stands for energy rejection filter. Which is, now, um, I'm sorry, Simon, if you have a Lunt or like a Coronado and you see the red filter in the front, that's what an ERF, an energy rejection filter is. So um, there are two different ways to do the ERF. If you're using a Quark specifically or a, a Gemini, it makes no difference. We'll just call it a Quark from now on. It just makes my life easier. Um in this particular case, because I have a 150, I've actually opted to use a front mount ERF. And the reason for that here is I do not want heat buildup inside of the optical tube itself. Now, if you're not out there for long periods of time like I am, like I've, I've been uh, doing this since 7 o'clock this morning, and my scope has been staring at the sun for an intense amount of time, if you use an internal ERF, the heat buildup inside of the scope is quite severe, and at some point you will have to vent that heat out. Uh, and you obviously age the inside of the scope, and it's actually not all that great for the actual quark itself. So apertures larger than 150, you should always look for a front mount ERF. And you can get them from all different um, random retailers, from Barda to um, Astro Hutech. Um, they have all different ways of doing it even daystar has their version uh the glass that they choose to use is actually yellow in color again it still works it's still an erf they they're totally safe i know Averages... a lot of them recommend on the smaller scopes which i have on my this is my daystar quantum setup right here um i use a uvir although i would really prefer a front mounted erf because it would keep the heat out because when I'm doing it, much like Simon, I'm doing outreach and we're running all day long. And I do think it does affect the performance of the filter itself because you're basically having the internal atmosphere of the telescope is heating up. So you have not only the atmosphere that you're dealing with, but you have internal tube currents and scene conditions built up in the tube because of the heat. So using a front mount ERF would reduce a lot of that buildup. And then like Simon is, I put mine straight and put the diagonal on the back, which I prefer that so it's not just hanging all off the diagonal. But in order to get the proper focus, I need an extender, which I, this is an idea I got from Simon. So this is an old prototype we had. So my power mate lives inside of there. And then this goes on the back with a couple other extensions on my Esprit's. And that's my filter chain with the ERF or the UVIR, which acts as an ERF further in the system. But I need a front mount ERF. Um, I will make sh uh, say this, though. Not all UVIR filters are made equal. You guys can um, swear at me, call me stupid, call me a Looney Tune, but they are not all equal. There are known issues with um, inexpensive base UVIR cut filters predominantly being uv leak or ir leak ir leak is probably by far and wide the worst thing you could ever encounter in this particular case so always go and get a good one if i if you want recommend uh, recommendations astronomic has a uh, something called the l series filter and l3 is the one that i prefer to use because it's the most constrictive and also cuts down on the uv side of things but you can actually get away with an l2 or even an l1 in certain cases they are a little bit pricey i'm not gonna lie but you gotta remember you're trying to protect an investment and you know the one that kevin just had up in his hands if he drops that that's like twenty thousand dollars just going up in smoke yeah this is a point for daystar quantum pe the professional edition ones um so yeah i hate to chunk. tell you this kevin <laughs> Using using an IR uh, UV IR filter that is not a very good one, or let alone an internal ERF. The problem here is is you will age your blocking filter very very quickly, uh, and in some cases this is more specifically towards uh, Lunt and Coronado. Is blocking filters will fog over time, and some will age faster than others, and that's actually because of the heat intensity that this thing's got on there. Moisture gets in on the inside, sits there, heats up, expands and contracts, and eventually condenses onto the blue glass specifically. And what happens here, it starts to calcify very quickly. 
and that's what you get is this weird fogging effect now if you have that it's not going to be oh my god i'm going to go blind if i look at it it's just going to basically deteriorate your viewing experience and how you can tell that's happening simply just by looking at the uh the, the blocking filter it will just look hazy and it won't have this fantastic lustery clear look to it that it first had when you first got it out of the box so i would recommend that if you already own any type of blocking filters just to double check that and it's not an expensive repair um the blue glass itself is is easy to replace if your issue is with the red glass on the other hand that's a whole different story that needs to be sent back in to be serviced because it means that internally there's something wrong it's very rare for the red glass to go bad but it does happen all right so any other questions related to scope and scope setup because um we need to move along because the Not clock is ticking the very quickly moment. i don't see anything put my chain back together all right so we're gonna leave this uh let me start the screen sharing on my other machines at screen three is what i'm sharing and i am going to stop the screen share here oh why did it go to full screen go away there we go all right hopefully you guys can see this i'm hoping my other screen will call it yeah, the processing so, screen. So let's get the first bit of data in. I've already actually captured some data ahead of time, so we're not trying to transfer files across a network and waiting thousands of years for a file to transfer, but I've got one here. So on my desktop, um, I have my data. And remember what I was mentioning? This is you know considered uh, 5 out of 5 seeing or very good seeing. And as you can see, it's a very, very stable image or somewhat stable image. What do you consider now, good seeing? Someone's asking, is good seeing anything below two? Two is actually, one and two are terrible. Yeah. Um, three is probably, you could do some full disk and be good. Four is probably where I would consider using what Simon is doing. And then five, obviously, is bring out as much aperture as you absolutely can. So Yeah, just drag everything out. Basically. But if it's one or two... Unless you've got like a 60 or smaller and you're doing full disc, I don't know that I would even bother hooking the yeah. cameras up at one and twos. So. Yeah, so generally speaking, uh, the scale for seeing between one and five is is if you had an 11-inch SCT, uh, obviously just downscale accordingly. So realistically speaking, a 150 uh, in terms of refractor is, you know, you need a four ideally. So this is considered, um, you know, five out of five four four and a half out of five i would say because it wasn't it's this particular capture isn't perfect but i'm going to show you what um two or maybe a three looks like this was taken uh, a couple of days ago and you can see this looks like it's underwater and boiling it's just horrible so let me make it really easy to see this uh, if you're wondering what this piece of software is it's just ser player uh, you can kind of like mess with it just to get uh, a higher contrast curve. But you'll see that, oh, wrong one. You'll see that there's just literally no detail to be seen. And this constant rippling just will not go away. And when you actually process this and you stack it, you just end up with a very, very blurry, messy image. Because to be honest, this the software just simply can't handle it. And this is what we would consider as poor to bad seeing and if you see this in the eyepiece or if you see this on your camera it just means that just just don't do it just don't bother just pack everything away it's too i know unstable. it's really yeah i know it's really disheartening but you're just basically collecting bad bad data you know there's like that famous saying as they say is garbage in is garbage out basically so that's why you kind of have to pay attention to seeing and again, there's ways to figure out how good or bad seeing is going to be. There's plenty of apps out there. I'm not going to go through them because we're here all night. Yeah, Clear clear Sky Clock is what I use, or Atmospheric, which is an app. It all uses those colored blocks. That's basically about the gist of checking seeing. So, so that's... Um, oh, we keep clicking on the same thing. There it is. So this is the one that we're going to go with. Again, I'm just getting it so we can see what's going on a bit better just to up the contrast. So what we're going to do is 
out of all of these frames you see here, we only need the ones that are really good in order to create a really nice image. So for those of you who are already familiar, the one that I'm going to be using is AutoStacker. It's probably one of the best free stacking software out there. Uh, it is for PC specifically. So if you're on a Mac, I suggest that you find your own, own alternative uh, for doing stacking. But I personally use AutoStacker specifically. So it's easy as just drag it in. And we're just going to set a stabilization point. And what the stabilization point does is just looks at the image and watches something move. If it starts to drift that way, it'll just pull it back at down. Um, I'm not going to go through some of these settings because, again, I've covered this before in previous videos. So we're just going to quickly go through this because it's just stacking at the end of the day. Uh, but I will go into uh, more detail with another piece of software that you can see open in the background. Now, everybody always asks me about anchor point sizes. Um, the idea here is you should always use multi-scale and cover the entire screen. You should not have any blank spaces anywhere. Uh, and if you do, then you need to adjust the sizing of this. Now, I will say this. Don't go too small because it'll take absolutely forever to be able to do anything. And as you can see, it's already taking forever and a day just to be <laughs> able to get to this point. But if you actually try to process this, it's, it will really bog your system down. So I found uh, a happy medium based upon my specific scope so if you've got an aperture for like say a 150 64 is the rough number to actually go with if you have apertures below uh, a 120 for argument's sake then you could probably go with 48 is is absolutely fine uh where are your other videos if people want to reference that uh youtube um so for those of you who don't know where i work i do work at a retailer um, if you go to YouTube and just simply type in telescopes.net, there'll be a bunch of videos. Somewhere in that collection is one of my solar processing videos. It's a little out of date. I will admit that because it's, it's getting on a bit. I haven't had a chance to sit down and create a new one yet, but it will give you the basics of how to use the software because the software itself never changes. Or you could just simply type, type in sharp cap and tutorial and, you know, the sky's the limit. All right. So while we're waiting for that, now, like I said, I took X amount of frames. Um, in this case, I took 500 frames specifically, and we're going to determine how many frames we're going to stack. Now, what I did was we did an an, uh, an analysis of how good the uh, image is. And what this does is it will actually rearrange all your images in the best to worst. And what that means is, is if you notice how good the sharpness looks on this particular frame compared to this one, which is the worst frame, hmm. you'll see what's going on. That's pretty cool. Now, AutoStacker actually rearranges all the frames for you in this particular order. And you can actually go through and reject individual frames. So if you happen to have a bug flying past, and no, they're not aliens. If you happen to have a bug flying past, you can actually get rid of it just by uh, eliminating that particular frame. So we're just going to assume that all the frames are fine. Um, I'm actually going to now set how many frames to stack. Now, this is all dependent on what your gain setting actually was. In other words, the higher your gain, the more frames you need to stack. Or should I say the noisier your image, the more frames you should stack. Again, we know that this camera is relatively low noise, so I can get away with a lower number. If you stack too many frames, what we're also doing is, is putting in bad frames or bad data into the final stack and we definitely don't want that so the general rule of thumb that i use is it's roughly 15 percent of what you currently have and it doesn't matter if you have a thousand frames or 500 frames the just the general average is going to be 15 percent. and what that means here is is this line here will represent the 15 percent, and it tells me that 75 percent of the frames Sorry, 15% of the frames are above the 75% threshold of how good they are. So in other words, I'm only going from here to here in terms of the frames. Because once I get past here, the image degrades more and more. And I definitely do not want to stack bad data. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's put the uh, grid back in there real fast. As far as the grid go, why are smaller alignment points better than larger? Um, the smaller alignment points is basically if you've got uh, a smaller aperture, obviously you start seeing more of the sun. If you're looking at certain details, uh, let me just clear this, for example. Ah, 
this detail here will get a lot smaller. If your point size is too big, the sampling of that data is going to be too big. So if this wiggles like it is here, what I don't want this to do is be caught in between something. So let's just do it like this, like that. That means that this square here and this square here has to try and line up. But the sampling data was taken from this. It will never figure it out. So it'll just do the best it can. And you end up getting um, lines that show up in your so images. The smaller points are more precise. Yeah. Isolating so the detail in a much smaller spot. Right, exactly. Probably the best way to say it. Uh, and then the, there's also a reason why I use multi-scale because I'm telling it to sample from multiple data points at different sizes. That's why multi is actually quite important. If I don't use multi, let's just turn it off for a second and just do small things. Uh, clear. What happens here is, is some of these boxes may not overlap enough and it will cause a waving pattern. In fact, you can actually see this line forming here and another one forming here if you look at it very, very carefully. When you actually go to stack that, and let's just assume it gives you a bad stack, you'll see that there's a slight obvious tear going on here, and you'll get weird little interesting problems forming up. Uh, that's why the multi-scale alignment for this particular case is actually the best way to do it, because it's taking multiple samples in all different scales in order to realign these images. So think of it this way. Each time you have one of these squares, it only references this, and then it looks at the one next to it, and it will get rid of this wiggling. So because stacking you... everything above the 50% mark is bad? Um, what do you mean stacking everything above the 50% mark is bad? It oh, was you mean, a question. Uh, the green line. Oh, for this green line? Yeah. It's, it's not necessarily bad. It just means that that's the data that is considered not as good. So, so just as being you... more picky. Yes. So the 25% mark is here, uh, give or take. This line here, the green line, tells me where all my good data is. Obviously, the very, very uh, left-hand side is actually at the top. You just simply can't see it. Uh, th again, the idea here is, is I do not want to stack any data below this green line. Ignore this gray line for a second. That, that's something else. I just need everything above this point. Ideally, if you can have everything above the 75% line, you will get the sharpest image you could possibly get. Mm hmm all right, so now I've got to hunt down where that file whistled off to, and I have no idea where, so hopefully it's uh, on the desktop somewhere. There it is. While you're searching for that real quick, should you use smaller alignment points for white light solar? Yes, absolutely. Um, when you're doing white light imaging and you can see the convection cells, it is actually more ideal to use smaller alignment points because if they're too big, this weird shuffling effect occurs. And you'll see, say, a patch here that is nice and sharp, and suddenly a patch here that is all weird and blurry looking. Uh, so it's because the smaller it, it the just... detail, smaller the points. Exactly. So if you guys are used to using auto stacking in general, you, and, and you were imaging Saturn, you don't use a big massive thing and just go right there and right there, and that's it. The more sample points you put in there, the better the realignment's going to be. And that is what basically gets rid of the scintillation, for lack of a better description. Awesome. All right, what's the time now? Four or two. Okay, so we're going to do this in literally five minutes or less because uh, we're getting to that crunch time here. So I've just quickly opened up the file inside of a piece of software called IMPPG. It's a free piece of software. This is probably one of the best uh, processing uh, software out there that you can get for free. Of course, you could use PixInsight and anything you, you want, but I'm just going to quickly go through this. Now, the magic of all of this is not actually in these sliders here but I will go through them in just a second. The magic is actually in the histogram, which is this. So first of all, we want to try and get the, the contrast to the best we can. And remember, I this is completely default settings. I haven't done anything yet. All I've done is change the curves. And more importantly, the data in that we got, we know is good. I haven't even done any sharpening yet and already we're seeing a fantastic result. And this is just default settings as I just opened up the software. So for some people who turn around and say, you know, I've got really good processing skills or I'm doing something spe specific or my quark is something special, it isn't. 
seeing is absolutely critical. That's what actually gives you this level of detail. Now that I have good data, I can now go in and make these adjustments to give me the best result. So again, I'm not going to go into too much detail with this particular um, function. So you'd have to watch the other videos because we're running out of time. But I'm just going to quickly go through and just do a quick sharpening of this. Uh, I've done this so many times, I kind of vaguely know uh, where to go. Now, a little bit goes a long way. Don't go crazy, otherwise you end up with a crazy looking image. A tiny, tiny amount of sharpening is all we need because we know our seeing has been so good. So we could probably back it you out. You can easily bit. add too much noise and grain to your image by over-processing. Right. Uh, and if this was a particularly noisy image by cranking this up, let me just give you a next prime example. We're going to go for the super fine details here. You end up amplifying noise and you end up getting these really horrible, weird results. Like, not like this, but the noise is really, really obvious. And it just doesn't look right. It just looks unnatural. So let me just set this back to a reasonable point. Now, some people ask me, oh, what about inverted images? Again, it's just simply as just doing this. That's all I'm doing is just inverting the uh, the curve. And that's what gives you that classic look that I always have. And again, I haven't gone through Photoshop. There's no weird jiggery pokery going on. At what you see is literally what you get. It's that simple. So seeing is critical. Uh, how right. would you use IMPPG to increase prominence visibility on the edge of the sun while not overexposing the surface features? Right, so I'm glad you asked me that. Um, now I do have to quickly drag one of the files out. If we go a little long, I don't think it's a big deal. So. It's all right. They don't pay me for doing this anyway, so I can go on as long as I want. <laughs> uh let me just randomly pull a frame out sure i don't care about viruses all right do 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 okay let's uh pull in this file dump it over here uh a quick, quick analysis there's only 300 frames so i know this will get this will go really really fast um, I should really mention this minimum brightness on a black background. Most of you will have a default setting and this should happen. Okay. I'm going to let you into a little funny, fun secret, turn it down to five. So the whole thing gets covered and there, there is a reason behind it. And I'll show you why in just a second. Uh, I'm just going to set this cause I kind of partially know what to do and off you go. Da, 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 dee, dee, dee. All right, it's done. File open. This was 75. There it is. Select all. Reset. Uh, reset. Reset. Remove. All right. So remember what I was telling you about the histogram. Where is the prominence? Okay. See this spike here? Let's start pushing that info. That is actually what's happening. You can see that by me changing this slider or the curve is what makes the prom show up. Now, remember what I just said about this black thing. Why did I set this to five and go all over the black areas? Well, what you probably didn't notice here is it looks like there's nothing here, but in actual reality, there is. And if I didn't actually have any of that selected, so it's like this, this data here would have been lost, which means I would have lost all of these really fine hair detail. In fact, you'd be surprised how much fine detail there is actually hiding inside of your data. And that's because it's all hiding in this part of the curve, uh, in that part of the histogram. Now, I'm just going to stretch this histogram out a little bit just so you can see it. If you're wondering what I just did there, um, this is called normalization of the background. All it does is it's set by... Um, my histogram to be stretched out ahead of time so normalize brightness level just set this to 5 and uh, 95 it just it tells you the edge here it's what we call the offset I, I don't want to go into it because it can get a bit overwhelming so we can now make full use of the entire histogram and if you can you know 
if you have a two screens, it's nicer to make this thing bigger so you see the whole thing. And you can really get into the whole thing and do like Very extreme precise adjustments. Fine tuning. The more points you have, the more you can really get into stuff and it's like, I don't want this, I don't want that, but I do want this. And you know, it's it's just a case of you can play forever doing this. And that was really interesting. I didn't expect it to do that. Sorry, uh, this the the version that I'm using is a uh, it's not a beta version per se. It's an earlier build uh, that does have a couple of hiccups occasionally. So let's go back to this and select all. So let's do this a different way. We're going to invert this. It's actually a lot again. It's a lot easier. Simply just click the invert button, and again. Assuming that my data was good, this is what gets me my detail. And some of you have noticed that uh, the limb darkening doesn't look as bad. Uh, you can kind of see it like this harsh line. There it is. Oh, I'm going to make it show up. But if you actually play around with the curves just right, you can actually blend out that limb darkening hmm. quite effectively. And you don't actually have to get into doing things like double stacking specifically. Double stacking, we'll probably come back to that on another talk because it is, it kind of divert, um, deserves a whole thing by itself. So that's actually how I get my prominence details to show up without actually overexposing both for the, the supposed surface and the limb of the sun. And of course, you then do all your sharpening things and techniques and whatever it is that you want to do afterwards here. Uh, I'm just going to do this very, very quickly just to give you guys an idea. I've got a couple questions floating for you. Perfect. So yeah, that's basically how that is done. The secret is in the curves. It's in the data that you capture. Do not overexpose your data. Like I said, don't allow the histogram to go above 70% just in case something's actually happening. Nice. All right, what was the question? Okay, um, I've had auto stacker struggle and error out with full surface images on an IMX 585. Normally try a thousand frames and stack 10%. Any suggestions? What was the error message specifically? Um, um, he'll have to say in the chat. So, uh, misadventures in Astro, if you could say what the error was specifically. Um, Got a couple other real quick stuff while he's typing that in. Um, is Skywatcher going to carry solar telescopes? It'd be kind of cool if we did, but right now I got nothing for you. Um, and then one word answer, please. ASI 178 or ASI 174, both mono. What scope, first of all? That's yeah. The actual, that's the answer to that. But yeah. if I'm going to give you a vague answer, 174 by a long shot. There's a reason why... The 174 over the 178 if it was for just one sole reason it's it's global shutter versus rolling shutter um, if you don't understand those phrases a global shutter uh, captures an image on the top half and the bottom half uh, independently like this whereas a rolling shutter is every other line okay you do not want a rolling shutter you want top half bottom half uh, and the reason for that is, is is so you don't get weird excessive movement that looks like it's tearing. And uh, rolling shutter has this effect. It will wobble like this when you move something too fast, whereas a uh, global shutter actually does this. Bottom it's half, a top half. Solar Max 260. Um, still go with the 174 if you're using the Solar Max. The 174 by a long shot. The only time you would use the 178, or should I say a small pixel size, is when you are when you have a small aperture. So if it's like a, a 40 millimeter or a PST. A uh, 183 the, would be awesome for that. So. Oh, God, would it? Yeah, it'll be so... It, it's That's awesome. what a 183 is for. A lot of people are using it for deep sky. They're terrible for deep sky because of how noisy they get in long exposures. But for solar really tiny pixels they shoot really fast and very clean high res with small stuff and then um for the bigger stuff you end up needing larger pixel cameras like a 174 or even better yet the new one that simon's using the apollo m max which is a 432 Two. yep 
big nine microns. pixels. So. Nine microns, man. So if you're shooting anything Daystar, you better have a 432 sensor um, to work with these big old things. Um, so the error message on the 585 question is a... Uh, where'd it go? Memory allocation. Oh, that's a rare one. That is probably system related, but let me just go through this. If you try uh, no buffering, uh, that can sometimes help. If you have improved tracking turned on, turn that off. It uses and sucks up a lot of memory. Um, there's not a lot you can do in terms of messing around with settings on Auto Stacker because. The guy who wrote it, uh, Emil, he he went out of his way to have it so it's pre-optimized. But on small occasions, you can run into issues. I would definitely turn around and say this. Check how much space you have on your hard drive. Um, and then also, it helps if you have an SSD or an NVMe-driven drive. And this is not related to solar. What I'm about to tell you is a lot of people don't know this. Anything that uses uh, flash-based memory or chip-based memory as opposed to magnetic media. When your drive fills up beyond a certain point or a certain capacity, it naturally slows down. So once your drive hits 50% capacity, it gets slower and slower and slower. Once you hit 90%, this thing becomes so slow that it's almost unmanageable, you'll actually get interesting errors popping up. Um, certain companies and certain manufacturers will produce different sized drives, and you'll notice weird numbers like... You won't get a 256 or a 512. You'll get a 540 or a 640 or some other weird number. And the reason for that is they use something called over-provisioning. In other words, it's a hidden partition on the drive that you can't see that dynamically increases in size or shrinks in size in order to accommodate when you fill up the drive. That's why certain drives still move really quickly, even though they reach capacity. But you'll tend to find those on higher-end uh, drives. So when you're buying something like this, remember... We're doing high-speed capture here. We need frame rates of like 60 frames per second, if not higher. Uh, in some cases, I can push mine to 120 frames per second if I really need to. Uh, but you have to have the ability to be able to transfer that data. The problem here is, is as your drive fills up, the slower it gets, and you need to know that you have to have the throughput. Again, stacking is the same thing. If your drive slows down for whatever strange reason or you end up with uh, memory issues, error messages pop up so the idea here is try not to stress it out turn off improved tracking uh in the the quality estimator when you're doing the stacking just go for ap mode a local which is this thing here not global for frame because it's more intensive turn off double stack referencing and all that kind of stuff just keep it at its bare minimum uh, otherwise you may have to check from a hardware level on your pc slash mac or whatever it is uh it may be a situation going on there very yeah, because on my remote machines, when I use them, I use this one, these one terabyte SAN disk or Seagate, um, one terabyte SSD 3.0 cables. These are fast and they write quickly. And then when I'm done, I'll transfer all the data that we shot outside on the laptop on this and I'll bring it in on the machine that we're working on right now. This is my processing machine, which is. 64 gigs of ram and it plows through data so making sure that your processing machine has ample ram on it to hand because these are the images are not necessarily big but the data file that is the video is massive um they're mostly a couple gigs a lot of times when you shoot so you will you will fill up a terabyte a lot faster than you might think because of the amount of data we're collecting for solar or lunar or planetary, you're collecting a lot more data in a shorter amount of time than say like deep sky. Deep sky, it's like, great, I shot 24 five minute frames. They may be big, but that's really not a big deal. Whereas opposed to what we were doing with Simon here, 500 to a thousand frames at full resolution and they are less resolution cameras than like a you know, a ZWO 6200 or some 60 megapixel monstrosity, but you need to make sure you have the data capability. Um, I know we're running uh, past, um, there's a couple questions here, Simon. Um, if you've got time, let's just keep going. I have a Red Cat 51 and a nine and a quarter SCT. What should I try for solar imaging? Neither or both. 
Uh, so a red cat is the type of design for the telescope is what is commonly known as a petsful design. Um, the problem here is is the rear element comes too close to focus, so too much heat will sit on that rear element. And what will happen here is is your image will constantly look off and out of focus. It's not that you can't do it; it's just the heat buildup on that is just too severe. And on a nine and a quarter, why not a nine and a quarter? You just simply have too much aperture uh, in that particular case. It'd be very then... expensive to adapt the nine and a quarter, even oh, even if you had the seeing to do it. The cost of a nine and a ten inch ERF, then the Edelon in the back, you're yeah several. Th you might as well just go get a Lunt sixty at that at point. that rate. Yeah, no, totally. I totally would agree with that. Or just simply buy another refractor that is uh, a doublet. Yeah, get a uh, cheap get Acromat just... and put a cork on it. Yeah, just in fact, I mean, again, I, I'm not saying this because this is a Skywatcher event, and you know, I love Skywatcher to death, but. By far and wide, out of every scope I've used, the Evo Star is by is the cheapest and the sharpest ones that I've come across in terms of like high performance, and even you know so to a less extent the Evo Lux series. But again, whatever you can get your hands on, the focuser is the critical part of it. That's why I use the um, uh, Evo Star 150 DX is because of that big hefty hefty focuser. Yeah um what focal length is best for visual solar viewing nice and short yeah i um, just got myself a lunt 40 double it's 400 millimeters thing is sharp all the time all the time doesn't matter if seeing is crap at 40 millimeters and um, 400 millimeter focal length doesn't care i would probably from my personal experience i would probably stick under 800 oh yeah definitely I would say no larger, again, for visual purposes, no larger than 60 as a starting point. Anything bigger than that, you're asking for trouble if seeing is not good. Yeah, I have a double stack Coronado 90, an original Tucson 90. Um, and there are days where it's just not happy. Like the images are soft. I can't nail focus. And that's simply because the seeing. Um, I think that's why you find a lot of 60s, whether they're Coronados or Lunts or even Daystar has their 60. You find a lot of companies hover around 60 millimeter aperture because it's the easiest aperture. It's the most aperture you can get on the day to day to look nice and sharp. And you never really have to worry about seeing conditions. Once you surpass about 60, you start seeing the seeing conditions become more problematic. And once you surpass 100 millimeters, um, you better have good seeing to use that instrument. So I know Lunt makes the 152s and the 130s and everybody goes on about it. Even Simon set up the 150 that you can see there on the left. There's a good chance that your seeing conditions will not support that on the day-to-day -day basis. So sticking around 100 or smaller, if you're just an average solar observer and you're not doing high resolution work like Simon, yeah. Um, Two more questions and then we're done because we've got to wrap it up. How do I color white light image yellow and H alpha and red in Photoshop? Uh, simply by changing the curves. Um, there was a reason why I didn't go into that part today because time constraint is the biggest thing. But the simplest way is to simply just modify the curves uh, without opening the actual software up in Photoshop create the layer or have the picture of whatever the, the thing is, the sun in this case, obviously, uh, move your red channel to the top left-hand corner and the blue channel to the bottom right-hand corner. And you can just kind of mess with it that way. Um, let's see. Would the QHY 5 3... 462? Yeah, the 462 mono or, mono or color be comparable to the 174 ASI? Uh, for frame size, no, the 462 is a lot smaller, a significantly smaller, but it is actually lower noise. So if you were doing high resolution, then yes, that would be a good choice. But for a small scope, it might be a bit questionable because you're just going to get a small area of the sun, uh, unfortunately, because it's cool. just such a small uh, sensor size. Um, and last one, Herschel Wedge on a 92 millimeter refractor. Yes, Herschel Wedge all day long. If you don't know what a Herschel Wedge is, it's a very special prism that is designed for white light observing um, on refractors. 
because you have no front filter. The light comes through the lens, focuses down, hits the prism, goes through the prism, and only a small amount is reflected back up through a polarizer. It is the cleanest white light image you will ever get because there's no absorption happening by a front material, whether that's glass or film or whatever it is. It's just straight sunlight. Um, so Herschel wedges, um, I have a brand new one on the way because um, mine got stolen in October before Seoul. Um, but I just picked up one and you guys have them at the store. Um, we do. Right now. Uh, they're the Starfield Herschel wedges. Um, they're like 300 bucks. So they are spendy for a white light filter. But the nice thing about it is you can use it on any refractor that you want. Um, up to six inch and the polarizer is built into the housing so you just rotate the eyepiece housing and adjust the polarizer it's awesome so yeah if you have a refractor and you want a serious white light filter probably the last one you will ever buy the herschel wedge and if you're looking for one in particular the starfield one that woodland hills uh, has in stock um, those are excellent um, if you're doing like eclipses, a front mounted filter is the easiest because of the simplicity for totality to remove it and stay in oh. focus. But if you're just doing solar imaging and viewing and for white light, I would only get a Herschel wedge. And the nice thing about a Herschel wedge is they're extremely safe. Like there's nothing that would crack. There's nothing that would fall off the front. It is always being filtered and handled safely. So it freaks a ton of people out. But it's actually, I think, the safest way to do white light when you have a refractor. Only a refractor. So Yeah. I will add one little minor thing um, to what Kevin just said in terms of safety, especially with uh, white light. If you guys are doing the annular eclipse, remember, this is not a total eclipse. When you're at the peak, do not remove the filter. Okay? That is absolutely important. If you're doing an annular eclipse and it reaches its peak... There's a reason why they don't call it totality. Uh, do not remove the filter because you are still letting in unfiltered sunlight. In fact, you could actually still damage your camera even if only 5% of the raw sunlight unfiltered comes through and hits the camera. It is basically you're making a giant laser beam. Yeah. That's actually what a laser beam is, but regardless. All right, I'm getting pinged to shut it down. So I know we oh, went a little long God. today. Um, I know if you guys want Simon back on, just let us know and we'll do another special episode about that. But Simon, thank you very much uh, oh, thank for you. hanging out with us. If you guys have any more questions, uh, you can always reach out to Woodland Hills Camera. That's where Simon works and you can ping him uh, for all that information. And there's other videos as well. If you want to see some of these filters in action, you can come to Seoul, which is taking place on October 14th, where the annular eclipse will be viewed. Um, here in Phoenix. Um, that's at focusastro.org if you want to know about that event again. Um, we'll have all kinds of filters out there. If you like what you see here, please go ahead and leave a like. Um, subscribe to the channel. Let us know we're doing a good job. You can always go to skywatcher.threadless.com if you want to do swag that also supports it. Um, so yeah, thank you guys for coming along. Um, and we appreciate it, Sime. And thank you very much. I will let you get to capturing some more cool stuff. And uh, we will see you guys next time. Thank you very much. Take care and have a good weekend. Bye.